Hey, Jake, how's it going? It's going well. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Absolutely. My pleasure. So for people who don't know who you are or what you're doing, so how would you tell them what, <laughs> right, about yourself? Oh, boy. Uh, oof. Okay, let's see. Uh, I am a professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor in my daytime job and uh, a completely unexpected post-retirement career uh, evolved in dog training. Um, I've been involved with uh, bull breeds most of my life uh, and didn't realize that my experience with them was abnormal. Like for me, bulldogs were just dogs, you know what I mean? And I didn't know until I started getting into recreational dog training that my experience with dogs was unique until other dog trainers were like, man, we got to, you know what I mean? Like you should talk <laughs> to people about pit bulls. You should, you know what I mean? Uh, and guys that I looked up to as mentors were telling me they wanted me to make presentations and stuff about my experience with bulldogs or bulldogs in general. And I was like, Oh, that's weird. Like I'm not good enough to do that, <laughs> but it wasn't about my skill set. It was about my background, you know? Um, but yeah, so it turned into an inadvertent accidental career. I thought when I retired from fighting, I was no, I wasn't going to travel anymore. And now I'm like traveling around doing workshops and seminars and presentations and stuff. It's kind of crazy. But as far as the training goes, like uh, I'm very, very much about uh, play as training. Uh, Ivan Balabanov is one of my main influences and mentors. And, and, and I definitely try as hard as I can to emulate that as, as the idea of play being the basis of training. Um, but the sport that, he plays is, is IGP. It's called now, it's used to be called Schutzen, but it was like, so it's IGP. Now the sports that I play were the old pit bull games of my youth, weight pole and wall climb and treadmill races and spring pole and things like that. The stuff that I grew up in, everybody told me, uh, man, if you really want to be into dog training and like doing drive expression and control, like there's sports that are drive control, uh, drive, like control sports, like AKC obedience and different varieties of obedience, but there's no drive expression. And then there's drive expression sports like dock diving and weight pole. And some of that, those dogs are bananas. So like there's no control. It's cool, but there's no control. And then I'm like, I like both. And everybody would tell you, man, what you got to do is get into the bite sports. There's French ring and IGP and Mondio and, and PSA. And, and it's like, I'm like, I don't know, man, I just want to play my games, but with control. So there wasn't really anything like that out there. So I just made a sport out of the way that I train. So the way that I train my dogs and therefore the way I train my clients' dogs, we just kind of codified it and made it a sport that everybody could participate in. And that is GRC dog sports. And what started as just kind of a little motivational thing for my own clients in my backyard has turned into kind of an international sport. Like it's in a bunch of different continents and all over the world. And it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, it just kind of fell into my lap. I am apparently the luckiest person in the entire world. <laughs> oh, so I guess my question is that what made you to be a dog trainer? Like what you said, you just got involved. So how, how that all started? It was a complete and utter accident. Like uh, <laughs> everything in my life is just a series of complete accidents. But uh, yeah, so I grew up in Louisiana and uh, dog fighting was kind of uh, commonplace in the crowd that I was in. Like I grew up in kind of a not such a good I don't know if they're going to see this or if this is just audio, but if you look at me, like I, I look like an ax murderer, right? Like I got banged up ears and I'm covered in tattoos and my face looks like I've been hit with a bag of rocks, you know, like I, I grew up rough and uh, fighting was just humans fighting, dogs fighting. Like it was just uh, ubiquitous. It was just part of the world. It was just violence and fights were just part of the world. I grew up in it. and I loved pit bulls like I loved the dogs I felt a deep connection with the dogs I loved working dogs I loved 
taking them out for drags. I loved working them on the treadmills. I loved working them on the spring poles. Like I lo- deeply connected and loved working the dogs. And I don't know, man, around 14 or so, I started having a bunch of conflict with the idea that something in my gut didn't sit right with dog fights. Like something was telling my soul, like I'm not okay with this. But like when you're a kid, you don't really choose what you grow up around. You just grow up around whatever it is. And it was, it was, it was a tough one for me because I was conflicted because I enjoy fighting and I made a profession out of it. Like I fought for decades and that's how I've made my living. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And my wife fights or used to fight. We both retired, but like my wife would fight. So when people are like, would you put somebody you love in there? I'm like, hell yeah, no problem. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Like I put teenage kids in fight. Like I love fighting. Fighting's a beautiful thing to me. But then something was in my stomach, like telling me it was wrong with the dogs. And I didn't really understand, but I knew I had to get out. So I just was like, I reject it. I'm not going to go around it. I'm not going to be involved. I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to be part of it. And around the same time when I was a kid, around 14 or so, 14, 15, something like that, one of my buddies got arrested for something unrelated, like some fighting or something. And uh, he just had this litter of like old family red pit bull, like game bred pit bulls. And he got arrested and I grabbed the puppies before they got confiscated. But now I'm like, okay, at 14, I was kind of put in the world of pit bull rescue. And this is in the eighties before that shit was, Oh, or can we curse? Okay, cool. I was was like, Oh, I forgot to check. I forgot to ask. Right. So that was before that shit was cool. Pit bull rescue was not cool in the the eighties. Nobody really knew what pit bulls were. Like the people that knew what they were, I wasn't going to give them to because I was like, I don't want them to go back in the fights. So I was like, do you know what this dog is? Like anybody was like, oh my God, what a beautiful red nose. Can I, can I, you know, are you getting rid of this? I'm like, no, you can't have them. And if somebody was like, what kind of dog is this? I'm like, all right, maybe you can have them, but holy shit, we got some work to do because anybody that didn't understand the dog had no idea what they were getting their hands in. Right. So at 14, I was in this idea of trying to explain these dogs to people outside the culture of those dogs. So I've been doing that forever. Second kind of line of accident was that I've always been in martial arts school since I was like five years old and I'm closing in on 50, right? So I've been in martial arts school since I was a baby and I've always had my dogs with me. Um, They were not pretend service dogs. I was just I think they were just too scared to tell my dad I couldn't bring my dog in. But anyway, (laughs) I would just always, it was just in the karate school, my dog was on the side of the thing. And in my judo school, the dog's on the side of the thing. So my dogs have always been like beside my leg my whole life. Like unless a cop tells me I'm not allowed to bring them in, they're with me all the time. So there's always been like this crowd of like a hundred captive people who've seen me living well with my dogs. Do you know what I mean? So anybody that had issues living well with their dog was like, hey, dude, your dog is amazing. How'd you do that? And I was like, oh, like this. And I'm just like helpful advice. But I was the dog guy. So my entire life, I've been helping people live well with their dogs and trying to explain pit bulls to people that didn't understand them. So that was just the background noise in my life. It wasn't a job at all. But probably towards the end of my fighting career, um, maybe in late, eh, like, like early 2000s, uh, some rescues would start getting in touch with me. Because like people would know people that would see me and they would go like, hey, man, you know, uh, my friend has a pit bull. Can you help them? Oh, yeah, sure, man, whatever. And I wasn't even charging. I was just like, yeah, whatever, dude, I'll, I'll help you, you know. And then some rescue would go like, hey, we heard you were the guy that's good with pit bulls. Can you come out? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I'm like, I'm not really doing it, but it's like, it's the reputation is kind of building a little bit. And then, like I said, uh, I retired from fighting and I got my hands on a, I started for some reason, I got, I got this one stupid female dog that was just an asshole, like just wildly human aggressive at 12 weeks, like put holes in Mandy's face at 12 weeks. And my entire life, 
was in the pit bull world of like, nah, you don't tolerate that. So like when I was a kid, we would have had to shoot that dog. Like that was just, it would have been like an old yeller movie. You're like, son, it's your dog. You have to do it. Like it would have, that was the thing. And I didn't want to. And I was like, man, there's got to be, I have to be able to help, you know, cause I've rehabbed humans myself. I was a piece of shit and I turned into a good person and I've helped a ton of people through martial arts become better people. So I'm like, there must be a way to apply this to dogs. There has to be. And so I started studying dogs. I started studying dog training as a serious subject of, of, of study in like 2010 and part of that was I went to a workshop uh Chad Mackin was in my area and I went to a workshop with him and through conversations with him was like man this is like I saw the avenue that I wanted to pursue through dogs or not not as a job but like as a area of study I was like this is where I'm paying attention like this is the style I need to try to pursue uh and he was like dude you're a dog trainer. I was like, no, I'm not. He's like, yeah, you really are. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, it kept going like that. And I would hit a couple of his seminars. And then at like the third or fourth seminar I went to, somebody goes, where's your facility? And I went, I don't have one. I'm not a dog trainer. And he was like, yeah, you are. And then just announced to everyone that I was now a professional. And then people started like, well, can you come do a presentation? I was like, what? <laughs> so then Chad had me come do a presentation at his, at like a, a guest spot at one of his, and then it just took off. So like, I don't know, man, like I couldn't not train dogs. Like people go, why'd you get into dog training? And I'm like, I didn't, I couldn't help it. Like it wasn't, I didn't go, this is the path. The path like made me. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, I couldn't have done anything other than what I did. I was going to fight and I was going to work dogs. And those are the two things that were going to happen no matter what I did. So that's what happened, you know? That's really cool. You know, um, I, I joke about, I said, no one, I grew up in China. I said, no one grew up in China. want to be a dog trainer. That's not your career path, right? Like this, what, right? Even till this day, my mom's like, do you have a real job? Like, yeah, like what? you know? <laughs> it's funny right well what's weird is my entire life I don't know I don't know what kind of audience you have or if anybody's gonna appreciate this but I was not involved like until 2000 yeah until like 2000 2001 like I'm a criminal like fighting was illegal I fought in the very first legalized MMA fight in Colorado in like 2000 maybe 2001 something like that Dude, until then, it was like, it was illegal. <laughs> like, the way I make my live, I'm a criminal. Like, I'm literally, I am a criminal. Like, the dogs I loved were illegal. My, the way I made my living was illegal. Like, I didn't have a bank account because I couldn't tell them where I got all the cash because it was like, you can't do that. You know what I mean? So, like, it was weird. In 2000, it was really strange because there was just all of a sudden a shift and I'm no longer a criminal. I'm a professional athlete and I'm like okay that's weird but whatever and then all of a sudden I'm not like the dude that works the game dogs I'm like a dog trainer and you're like oh okay I had two careers that were never supposed to happen just fall on my head and you're like I guess I'm an entrepreneur now not a criminal <laughs> so you got legitimized <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I'm, I got to figure out how to pay taxes and stuff. I don't know what's <laughs> happening now. This is crazy. Do you tell people you make money? Like, is this how that works? I don't understand. <laughs> and I don't know how geeked out you want to get on science of dog training, but it's like, there's kind of the quadrants of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, stuff like that. And it's like, everybody knows, and you can train with negative reinforcement and you'll get compliance to a certain point for sure, but you won't get joy and you won't get like pursuit of extra and additional like you do as much as you need to do to relieve the pressure and that's all you do you don't seek out more right but when you're training with like positive like when somebody is trying to get to the goal they want to get more you get joy you get additional pursuit you get striving for better because they want that amazing thing like so that's kind of the dichotomy and the problem is everybody knows you're supposed to look into the idea of creating the chasing of joy in your dogs but then we don't apply that to our clients clients come in to train dogs and all they want to do is make them stop biting make them 
Make them stop barking. Make them stop pulling. All they want is negative reinforcement. They're just like, just make the bad shit stop, please. And as soon as you go here, this is all you got to do to make the bad shit stop. In my head, I'm like, dude, we can go so much further. I can give you so many more skills and so much more joy in your life. And it's going to be great. And they're like, nah, I'm sad. I'm out of trouble. And that was always really disappointing to me that people were always kind of stopping like not stopping like before the dogs were quote unquote solved because we could get them out of the hole, but they weren't then pursuing the rest of the available aspects of dog training. I was like, this is such a bummer. Your dog has so much potential. Like you could do so many cool things, but then it hit me like one day. So a lot of my training, because I do a lot of game-based training and I do a lot of drive work with my dogs. A lot of my training was in the sport world, not the pet world because I want to learn like Ivan's training people to go to the world championships in, in IGP. And I'm watching these people train. And when you go to a sport dog, when you go to a working dog seminar, like, man, I went to a seminar at Ivan's place in Florida and a dude drove an RV from like Alaska for a three day seminar and they're happy, happy to do it. And you're like, Oh my God, like the level of commitment those people have to their training is bananas. And then when you stop and look at it and you look at it through terms of dogs, you're like, we're running a negative reinforcement model on our clients, but sport dog and working dog people are running a positive reinforcement model. They're pursuing the gold medal. They're pursuing the next title. They're pursuing the thing they want to achieve. And so their commitment and their joy and their passion is way higher. And then I'm like, okay, I've got to find a way, just like the dogs. My dog has no interest in a down. He could give a shit. So I've got to get him sold on this game that we're going to play with a toy and then show him the down is the conduit to the game. I get buying on the, on the down all day. Same thing with, with my clients. How can I get my clients to, to not just down to get them to stop biting the mailman, but like to find the joy in the training of the down. And then I'm like, okay, same thing as the dogs. They play a game. So here's the game we're going to play you guys. Instead of just you do your boring, you know, we're going to get together on Saturday and we're going to do this. We're going to have loose leash walk test. We're going to have our basic position changes. And then we're going to put the dogs on the spring pole and who can out and recall off the spring pole. And then I had these people who were kind of doing the minimum training like most pet dog clients do. All of a sudden they're like posting pictures of them training twice a day and like, getting got up early and got my position change work in and you're like wow like the level of motivation switching from pursuit of excellence instead of getting out of trouble made me realize like that's the modality and that's the power of the of the idea of sport instead of just get out of trouble so we just said screw it we started doing it and i happened to have a podcast going that i was doing with chad uh, mackin way back in the day, dog training conversations, we ended it a, a year or two ago, but it was, it went for years and we were doing this podcast and I was talking about that concept, not trying to make a sport, just talking about what I was doing with my own personal clients, developing a game for them to play, to increase their motivation and training. And all these people started contacting me going, man, that sounds great. I want to do it. Do you have like the structure written out? And I was like, no, I'm just doing shit at my house. No. <laughs> And they're like, well, could you write it out? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I wrote it out. And then it's like, well, hey, what about this? And I'm like, oh, man, I guess we'd have to make this rule for that. And then they're like, well, you know, is there like a title? And I'm like, I guess there could be. And then it just became a dog sport and then just spread all over the world. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, okay, cool. I guess that's happening now. Yeah, I guess from the outside, I look like a hustler because I have all these businesses and all these career paths, and I'm really just not. It just falls on me. I just go, whoa, I'm apparently the president of an international dog sport now, I guess. Okay. And it just happens. You know, the work you're putting in, also, you know, one thing I really want to ask you, so being a fighter, how mm. that affect you training dogs and helping people? Dude, it's the exact same thing. Like, like it's, it's, it's not a metaphor. It literally is the exact same thing. It's like motivating a being is motivating a being no matter what. Like it's doesn't matter if it's people or, or dogs. 
And yes, people, when you teach people a certain skill, when you teach people some things, you can use language, you can fall back onto language. So if I'm gonna teach a kid math, I can do that purely through language. And obviously I could never teach like that to a dog because I'm relying on the modality of language. But when you teach fighting, like you are doing things that are beyond language. Like I can tell you all day to calm down in a fight, but you hearing those words is not going to help you. <laughs> like I teach people to calm down in the same way you teach dogs to calm down because at that moment, they are the same. Like <laughs> you're not formulating complex thoughts at that moment. You're not, you know what I mean? They're literally exactly the same thing. Taking a kid that's a coward and teaching them how to be somebody is the same thing as taking a dog that's a coward and teaching them how to be somebody. Taking a kid that's a, very full of himself little shit and teaching them he's really not that big a deal is the same thing as taking a dog that thinks they're a big shit and going hey dude you're not and stop it you know what I mean some kid that doesn't see the value of relationship and is therefore completely shitty socially teaching them there is value in relationship I can show you making it meaningful and then using it to help guide them it's the exact same thing as dogs. It's the same thing. It's like down to the science of it. You know what I mean? Like negative reinforcement, it's the same negative reinforcement that you apply to a person. Combining reinforcement strategies, applying a little negative reinforcement when they go the wrong way, they go the right way. You remove that pressure and then go, nice. I do the same shit with kids boxing as I do with a dog on a spring pole. It's literally the same thing. In fact, in my gym, there's a heavy bag and then next to it is a spring pole. <laughs> So there's a kid hitting the heavy bag and next to him is a dog hanging off a spring pole. You know what I mean? There's a dog treadmill next to the mat. Like dogs are running on mills next to the mat. You know, there's the deadlift bar and there's the sled for the dog to pull in the same gym. It's the same shit, you know? So, you know, it didn't happen accidentally, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think life not to get too philosophically crazy, but I think life is a series of random chances. And it's just like a fight. Fighting is a metaphor for life, right? Like there's these opportunities that arrive and leave. They show up and they leave. They show up and they leave. And you've got to have the emotional, you've got to have, you've got to be in the emotional spot to notice that the opportunity has arisen. You've got to have the you got to have the courage to decide to act at that moment if you've noticed it and then you got to have the skill to make that execution you know uh, uh doable successful should you notice it and then choose to do it and if you're missing any of those three things the opportunity passes you know what i mean so it's like i i totally acknowledge i'm not an idiot like i know that my perseverance and hard work set me up for success i get it but I also don't ever want to be the guy that's like, I totally did this. <laughs> like it, it implies that just through sheer, you know, does, people are like, you just got to want it. No bullshit. You got to make shit happen. You got to want it. Notice the chance, have the courage to run through the window and then successfully stick the landing. It's not just want, want don't mean shit. You got to be able to do it. So like, I don't ever want to be the guy that is arrogant enough to say I created it but I acknowledge the fact that like I was lucky enough to get the opportunity and skillful enough to make the opportunity work. You know, I've seen dog owners that themselves, for example, doing all the like CrossFit, right? Iron Man, that type yeah. of thing, but they can't handle their dogs. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. You know? Uh, yeah. I just, it's, it's, it's weird. People have an interesting, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to go with this, but people have a really interesting thing with dogs, man. They like, they either over anthropomorphize them or they under anthropomorphize them. And I, it's bizarre. People are like, you know, they'll be doing CrossFit and, and lifting weights and eating like really clean and keeping journals. And then their dogs just bad and sick you know it's just like a potato 
and just so unfulfilled with life and just so you know what I mean you're just so sad and you're like <laughs> but you know you're like dude work your dog and they're like but he's so comfortable and he doesn't and you're like you just did burpees till you threw up like what <laughs> what did somebody make you did you have fun yeah I loved it well then why do you imagine it's horrifying and terrible and I get the fact that there are dogs that don't enjoy exercise, just like there's people that don't enjoy exercise. And you shouldn't force any dog into a lifestyle that is not biologically suiting for them. But man, people will just, it's weird. They'll just decide ahead of time what the dog's supposed to be and then cram it into that box. They don't allow for the dog to be what it could be or should be or maybe. They, they just, they had a dog when they were 12. And doesn't matter what dog they have now, that dog's going to recreate fucking Lucky no matter what, dude. I'm going to feed you until you're so fat you're as lazy as Lucky was. Or or I'm going to make you run until you're as active as Lucky was. And that, you know, both of them, the dog's like, dude, just let me be me. Like, what are you doing? Um, yeah, it's bizarre. Like, uh, people have this interesting, like, they they look at dogs as some kind of different thing to the point where it changes the way they behave with them and you almost have to teach them like treat them like a sentient being <laughs> you know what I mean? like treat them like they are a thing and then they'll do much better you know yeah i guess this is probably almost like have to dive in like human psychology somehow oh, you yeah. know i've seen dog owners like super fit right like they, their picture on facebook is like how they roll a tire and stuff like that yeah. right <laughs> in the mud and then yeah. their dog, I work with a lot of feral dogs are really fearful yes. and their dogs like shaking in the house. Right. And I said, okay, you need to push your dog a little bit. Let's teach your dog. To be like, oh, but she's so scared. <laughs> so, I'm like, but you push yourself to do all of that thing, but somehow it's yeah. not able to push the dog to do a little more. So I think yeah. still, yeah. there's a, there's a problem with, there's a problem with like, I think this is a problem, not just in dogs, but I see this is a problem with the way people raise their children, honestly. Like I repair a lot of broken adults because they were raised in that way. Like they were not challenged. They were not pushed. Pressure and fear folds them in half and they hate it. And they come to me to try to figure out a way to not be that way anymore. Um, but it's like, and I think instead of looking at instead of looking at my responsibility to this being is to set them up for an eventual amazing life, not fix this moment now. You know what I mean? Like when you have a kid, you know, all of those little moments aren't about this moment right now. It's about setting them up to be the best version of themselves they can be later like when your are if your kid goes ow i have a thorn in my foot well we need to deal with this moment now i need to take that thorn out because we got to fix this right now this moment we need to fix my leg is broken well we need to put a fucking cast on that thing because we need to fix this moment in time but you also look at almost every interaction with that kid for what does this mean later like when the kid goes i don't want to go to school you don't go like let me fix that i can easily fix that i'll call you in sick no problem like i can fix this moment in time right now no problem you don't do that because you're like i mean i could but jesus you're gonna turn into a piece of shit you're gonna just be the whiniest little me and we know that so we're like kid you got to go to school i'm sorry i love you but you got to go to school because we know at that moment, what's more important is setting them up for future success of who they will become, not fixing the moment for the kid that is in front of you right now. But people, for some reason, just don't apply that to dogs. They just fix every moment at that moment. I don't want them to suffer. And that's a true statement. I don't want, dude, I don't want my child to suffer, but you got to go do the book report. That's going to suffer. They're going to suffer for days freaking out about doing the book report the day they wake up they're gonna feel like shit they're gonna cry and throw a fit and want to skip school they're gonna not want to go they're gonna be a jerk to their like it's three or four days of absolute suffering and i'm gonna make them do it 
But that's because I need for them to develop the skill of pulling themselves out of the tailspin of suffering. They need to know that to be okay. But if I tried to fix that moment right now, I would immediately go, book reports are off the table. You never have to do a book report again. And I think people look at their dogs and they're not thinking of their future development. They're not thinking of raising their dogs. They're thinking of that dog in that moment. And very often what is best for the future is not necessarily the most awesome thing right now. And that's not an excuse. Now, now let me say, uh, I've used the word negative reinforcement and I sound like I'm advocating the use of pressure on a dog. And a lot of the words I've just said could be used by turds to do bad things to dogs. And we're not, the, I'm not one of those people. And I don't advocate being an asshole to any being ever. It's about building them up and making them better and stronger. Not, you know, making myself feel powerful, powerful by my dominion over them. It's not like that. So a lot of the words I say can be misconstrued. Like if I say, Hey man, sometimes you got to kind of, you know, you can't worry about being your kid's friend. You're going to have to be their, their, their parent and guide them. People are like, yeah, kick them in the mouth. And you're like, that's not what I said. I did not say that. Do you know what I mean? Like that isn't, you're taking that liberties, you know? Um, so yeah, I am saying that I think you need to not think at that moment of how to give the most comfort in that moment, but think how can I give the most overall comfort in life? Because by making you face that fear now, I can set you up where you are not scared of things later. By making the kid do the book report, you can teach them standing in front of a room full of eyes staring at you is not the worst thing in the world. And you've just steeled them to peer pressure. Because a lot of kids do a lot of regrettable shit because everybody looks at them and they want to take that pressure off. They're like, I don't like the pressure of all these eyes. And they'll do whatever they got to do to make the eyes turn off. And that's a terrible thing. But you didn't steal that kid to peer pressure. You know what I mean? You didn't steal that kid to the awkwardness of the stare. So like, we got to do that. Like I've got to teach my dog and my kid or whoever to come out of the tailspin of fear and bring them back to like, this is how I can catch my balance and find my success. You know, it'll set them up for the most comfort over time. It's just right now, it's not fixing this particular situation. But I don't know why people do that with, like they do that I don't know, man. They're like, they're so fast to not view dogs that way. You know, they baby the dogs, you know? Yeah. They baby the dog more than they baby the kids sometimes. Yeah. I wrote an article a long time ago about, uh, it's, I can't remember the title of it, but basically it was like, maybe you should treat your dog like your kid. You know what I mean? Because people know you got to raise kids and with dogs, they're just like, it's perpetual baby. You know what I mean? Like baby. Now, don't get me wrong, dude. Like I love all my dogs. I'm like, oh, I'll make out. I'm famous for making. You look at any of my Facebook posts. It's me just making out. If anybody tags me in a post with a dog, I either look like we're fighting to the death or we're making out because those are the two avenues I go with my dog. Like fun, like tug, like, ah, you know? Uh, but man, I'm like, I baby talk and make out and they lay, they sleep under the covers in my bed. I'm not that tough guy, but I don't baby them. Like I expect them to be the best versions of themselves. I'm raising them to be their best version, not keeping them as an infant. You know what I mean? People just get this like, like, dude, your dog's four. <laughs> what are you doing? Like what is, oh, he can't. Well, he never will if you think he can't. You know what I mean? Come on, man. Like, I don't understand. People expect so little from their dogs i mean it's happening to kids too man kids kids are the same thing now man they're whew, kids and dogs just shit's just getting soft so hard it's so bad like kids will come into my place at 10 13 10 12 13 14 years old and they cannot look you in the face they're just staring at their shoes and you're like whoa dude like high school is not going to be kind to you, kid. <laughs> like, you're in deep shit. Like, you need to pick your head up, kid. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, I, I thought I was having a tough childhood in China. Jesus. <laughs> it's weird, man. Tough, like, tough childhoods. 
I mean, the problem is what doesn't break you makes you stronger, right? Like stress is either adaptive or maladaptive. So tough childhoods, yeah, they can break people, but they very often make very resilient people. The, the people that don't break come out the other end hard as hell. And that's a good thing. The problem is when you don't apply that judiciously. If you apply the same amount of pressure to every being, you're going to break a lot and you're going to make a lot shine. The problem is not with the concept of adaptive pressure. The problem is you're not adjusting the pressure for the being in front of you. You're just, it's like I have a bench press and it's got 200 pounds on it. And if that breaks your sternum, oh well. And if that makes you a power lifter, then wonderful. That's a terrible representation of weightlifting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I should figure out what is your threshold, stay below it, but enough close to it to press forward what your threshold becomes. And then everybody gets stronger. Maybe you never become a competitive power lifter and that's okay. Maybe, but maybe you just find a little more athleticism and a little more durability and that's wonderful. You don't just, hard childhoods are bad. Hard childhoods are not bad. Indiscriminately hard childhoods are bad. You know what I mean? The right amount of pressure is beautiful. Beautiful. Like people pay me as a coach to apply the pressure. Like they literally do that. Like they bring their kid to me and go, I, can you please help and apply a little bit of pressure? I can't. It's the same thing with dogs. People come in and they're like, my dog's crazy. And you're like, they'll literally go like, my dog's doing this. What do I do? I go, do you like that? And they go, no. And I'm like, did you tell them? <laughs> tell the dog you don't like it it's not a big deal right like same thing with their kid like my kid is uh and you're like okay they're literally farming like i don't want to dig a ditch so i hire somebody to dig a ditch i don't want to fix my toilet so i hire somebody to fix my toilet they don't want to apply pressure so they hire someone to apply pressure and it's like man i just i want to teach them how to live i don't want to apply the pressure for them i don't do board and trains like, I don't want to apply the pressure for them. I want to teach them how to live with their dog. It's like relationship counseling for people and dogs. You know what I mean? It's way less about the science of training and more about relationship counseling. Yeah, I love that. I don't do board and train either for that similar reason. Yeah. Um, my board and train can be really successful at my place and the first several months at client's place. Then when there's their own pressure happening, they don't know how to handle it. Yes. And they can't do that. I, I, uh, I do an interesting version of board and train. I don't take the dog, the people and the dog come up and stay. So like people will show up for a week. I mean, some people show up for three or four days. Some people do two weeks. I mean, I had one girl come out for six or eight weeks. Um, but they come out and they find a play called an Airbnb or something and they stay here. And we train their dog twice a day, just like you would get them out to work twice a day in a board and train. But they're trained, like I might work with them or I might work with their dog, but it's like, the point is you guys, it's like when you see like uh, those getaway retreats for couples or something, like that's what it is. It's not a, I'm gonna work your dog. It's you guys are gonna figure this shit out. <laughs> like you guys gotta get on the same page. And I spend a couple days to a couple weeks getting them on that on that page and that to me works much better because then it's like it's man i can take almost i can take most dogs and make them look cool in a day you know what i mean like you're just like oh yeah me and i can work it out with this dog and like we vibe and it's good it's no problem but that doesn't fucking help like it doesn't you know what i mean it's like martial arts schools kids come in dude it doesn't matter how many dudes i can beat up like People are like, yeah, it's a great school. Look how tough that guy is. I'm like, who cares how tough he is? How tough are his students, man? Like, if everybody in the room is getting their ass beat except the guy that runs the gym, that's not good. Like, that doesn't help you. You know, like, it's what can I make you, not what can I do that matters. So, like, for me, the stay and train is way better than a board and train. To me, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad for everybody. I know a lot of people do it and it, that's cool, whatever, you know, but like me person, especially as much as I am reliant on relationship and play, it doesn't, if I have a great relationship and I have great play skills, it's like if, if I'm going to train a dog on an e-collar and you're not going to have an e-collar, it's not super helpful. Like if I'm going to tra train using play and relationship, you need to go home with the tools I'm working. 
And those are the tools that work. So you need to have them. Unfortunately, I can't give them to you in a box. You have to build it. So you kind of come here. I'm going to help you build the tools. Then you take the tools home, you know? Yeah, I remember. Well, I don't remember where I read this, but I use it with my clients nowadays to talk about you can't outsource the relationship with your dog. Yes. yes, 100%. It's interesting that you mentioned the kids, I guess, in a sense, so spoiled or somehow so lack of self confidence nowadays. Yeah. And I remember I read a book, um, I think it's from Perry Marshall, 80 20 rule. Okay. And he talked about his kid. He said, Do you know when you realize your kid is spoiled? When your kid come back with a cup of coffee, said, my latte is too foamy. And, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and what he did, he took his kid to one of the most underdeveloped country yeah. to go see those people, see how they live, and uh, let's go take a look. And his kids, on the first day, like, OK, dad, I got what you're saying. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because there's a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of suffering that you have to learn how to endure to be a functional being because life is going to put some shit on you. Like it's gonna, <laughs> it, it will hundred percent. So it's like your job to me is to prepare them for that. So spoiled to me is just like this. It's, it's not about having money or having resources. It's can they suffer? Like, I know that sounds terrible to say, but like, can they endure is a better word. Can they persevere? Like, can they find hardship and stick through it? You know? And that's a thing that is to me a big deal in, in training, especially dogs. It's the same thing. It's like, it's not so much, can I get them motivated? Can I get them pumped or whatever? It's like, can I teach them how to correct the ship and bring themselves out of a negative emotional experience? Like, so I don't know if you, you, you follow any of Jock Pink's up stuff, like neurobiology at all. Uh, no, but I did, you know, my, a lot of my current, I guess, methodology and stuff, it's more of a relaxation work. Nice. A nice. uh, little bit like Casey Carver, right? I trained with her for a bit. 